Okay, great. So hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Wazaku's 13th online discussion. Um, and today we again discuss the stigma around mathematics. I'm Dr. Dumani, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at Stellenbosch University, and I'm so delighted to introduce our presenter today, who is Professor Kim Beswick. She's a professor of mathematics education, and she's also the head of the School of Education at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Professor Beswick has over 13 years of experience of teaching in the rural schools. She also has over 100 peer-reviewed research outputs and over the course of her career has, um, has, has received more than 10 million Australian dollars in research funding. Um, this is about 114 million rand, so it's quite substantive. Um, and so it really is an honor for us to have you with us today. Before we begin, let's just go over a few house rules quickly. Firstly, keep your cameras off and your mics muted during the presentation. And then afterwards, you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions. And you can do this by either putting your name in the comments or raising your hand. And then we'll ask you to ask your question or make your comment. If you feel a bit shy, don't worry about that. You can put your question in the chat and we will read the question for you. So I'm about to hand over to Prof Beswick for her presentation. And then afterwards, I'm going to invite you all to join us in the discussion. And in this part, you can ask any questions, you can make any comments, or you can even share your experiences. So without any further delay, let's welcome Professor Kim Beswick. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you all. Um, I'll just start um, getting my screen up there. I think that should be appearing shortly. Okay. Um, now I'm not. I'm not sure if it's there yet. It's coming. Yep. I'm not going to talk for too long, I don't think, because I, I really would like to um, have a chance to engage with your questions and to hear your experiences as well. That would be um, really, really interesting for me. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, say some things that hopefully will stimulate some conversation. That would be fantastic. So here we go. So that's the topic I was asked to speak to you about. So I'm talking about... Um, low socioeconomic communities and also rural communities. So I didn't put that in the title there, but um, often there's an overlap in those two anyway. So, um, oh, sorry, there was a speaker of mine switching off, if you heard that. <laughs> okay, so just moving on. Let's see how I can get this to move. Down there, I've got two these screens. There we go. Um, some of you will recognise, probably, you might recognise the bottom picture. That's a picture of Sydney, the famous Harbour Bridge. Um, and I'm calling this slide a tale of two countries. Um, just to tell you something about the situation in Australia. On the next slide, I'll talk about more about the international situation. But certainly in Australia, um, when we think about educational attainment, it is almost like there are two countries. There's um, the metropolitan centres, uh, like big cities like Sydney and Melbourne. Um, in fact, almost 20% of the Australia's population live in the Sydney area. Um, most Australians live in big cities. It's one of the most highly urbanised countries in the world. But the vast majority of Australia's landmass um, is not um, metropolitan. So the photo at the top of the screen there was taken uh, just a couple of weeks ago when I went on a drive just in New South Wales, the state um, of Australia where Sydney is. And I, that six hour drive from Sydney, I was still in the same state. Um, and this is a, a rural area where a few years ago it was in drought, but now it's looking rather nice. Um, and it's just a different world in the little towns out there in terms of educational attainment and, and um opportunities for kids and these these issues are not um, confined to Australia they're certainly not confined to New South Wales 
Um, the OECD um, has produced data that show that relative to their peers in, in metropolitan areas, rural students um, perform less well. They tend to be in poorer communities, so they are lower socioeconomic status communities as well. Um, those communities tend to be more ethnically homogeneous and more cohesive, so that can um, the, the cohesion in those communities can be a real strength of them. Um, students in those communities are more likely to work for pay outside of school. They're less likely to um, think that they might attend university, and indeed they are less likely to um, complete a university qualification. They also um, have tend to have less experienced and less well qualified teachers and this is especially a problem in mathematics and science. Um, in in um, Australia there are schools that are not too far away from big cities that have no really well qualified mathematics teacher for example so there's not even a well qualified teacher to whom the other teachers can go for advice so that, that is a real problem. And the further you get from a city, the more likely that is to be the case. Um, in Australia, at least, uh, and I discovered this when I was out there um, in the country uh, recently, they're less likely to have reliable internet access and less access to specialist teachers and support staff. So the kinds of teachers who like um, um, counsellors and psychologists and career advisors and those kinds of people are harder to find in rural schools. So um, lots of overlap between those factors. I'm not sure why my slide moved on, but it did. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of my work has been about the beliefs of teachers. And so I've, I've looked in a number of studies over the years about the beliefs teachers have about mathematics and mathematics learning and teaching and so on. But more recently, I've been doing more work on um, rural and low SES schools. Um, low SES schools are not just rural, but as I said, there's some overlap there. Um, and looking at the beliefs of teachers um, about students in, in those places. And a lot of it, um, although I know teachers, and I'll say a little bit more about why I think teachers say these kinds of things, um, there, you could describe some of the things they say as almost um, blaming the victim. <laughs> it's, so you'll notice from those quotes um, that came from a study that I did back in Tasmania, it's a, an island state at the south of Australia where I used to live, um, they're talking about the problems being um, originating in the families that the students come from. Um, they're talking about a degree of itinerancy as well, where families come and go and, and um, when their employment's probably not stable and so forth. The students are disinterested. Um, the families don't value education at all. And um, the teachers recognise that this is a, a problem that's going to be hard to change. Um, the students say, this other next teacher said, um, are not motivated in core subjects, so things like maths and English. Um, and again, they're saying that the families don't see those skills as important or relevant for those students. And they note, of course, that students who have supportive families achieve at a much higher level. Um, one, of the, one of the most shocking quotes I have ever heard is from a former student who actually said that she was talking about her experience of going to school in just a very low SES um, place. It was in a largish town, actually, so not particularly rural but it was definitely low SES. And she talked a lot about um, spending time in class, not actually learning, not focusing on any work, not being expected to, just chatting and sitting around and um, bantering with the teacher and not really doing very much. And it was only when she went on to a different school for um, further education, which was um, very unusual for students from the school she had been at, that she realised that, oh, I, I should have just asked to be taught. <laughs> and she didn't realise that she had to do that, and, and she, I guess she shouldn't. So there, there are some, um, those sorts of beliefs where teachers are laying the problem at the feet of the family. Um, it's not very helpful. It's not going to lead to teaching that's going to um, assist those students, e even if the things they're saying about their family problems are true, it's still not um, very helpful. 
and I, I tend to to see this and as I've explored this over the years as not that teachers don't care about students and that they don't want to assist these students I think they really really do but often they're just at a loss as to how to the problem seems so big the students um, have real needs beyond their educational needs sometimes they come to school perhaps um, not having breakfast not terribly well clothed um, and so the, the teachers see all of these problems they're not quite sure what to do the students seem resistant to their efforts to teach them um, and they don't know what to do about that and so locating the problem outside of themselves and things they can affect is almost a protective mechanism for teachers I think um, so I don't um, blame teachers at all for, for these kinds of things I think they're they're doing their best but nevertheless it's not not um, helpful um, this next slide are some other beliefs that have come out of various studies that we've done over the years um, teachers and even school principals have have said things like these students meaning ones in a low SES school or a rural school have said that these students don't need high level maths so they're making assumptions there about the kinds of um, further study and the kinds of careers that are relevant for the students in their in their schools. Sometimes they're just referring to the lower streams, sometimes to most of the kids in the schools. Um, and sometimes this is also a way to rationalise the fact that we can't get a well qualified maths teacher to teach the most demanding math subjects in the senior years of secondary school. So we can kind of justify that by saying, oh, well, they, these students aren't going to want to do that anyway. They don't want to go to university. None of them are going to be doctors or engineers, so it doesn't matter. Um, so that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. Um, in, in the most extreme cases, I, I have seen schools where they weren't even offering um, science in years nine and 10 because these students don't need that. Um, and again, that made it easier to offer less maths as well, or lower level maths. Um, there is evidence that um, teachers on average in low SES schools see those students as less capable than students in more affluent schools. So um, that's not helpful either. Um, I've shared that result with um, some of the teachers from whom I got that result. This was a study of several hundred teachers. Um, where we just divided the schools around the median of the SES measure we were using and there was definitely a statistical difference between the two halves of the sample. Teachers were surprised and a little bit outraged by that but nevertheless that's what the data, data say. Um, there's also from other studies I've found that teachers make assumptions about um, ability based on student behaviours and even their appearance. Um, so things like, um, you know, I've just asked teachers in some studies, how do you know a student's good at maths and, and you know, what, what characterises them? And they'll say things like they don't know their basic facts and so on, but then they'll go on to say a whole lot of things like they miss classes, they come late, they don't bring equipment with them, um, they're not motivated. And, and so they're talking about a whole lot of behavioural things that are not necessarily anything to do with ability. But those things are all lumped in with um, assumptions about their ability. Um, the third dot point there is one I alluded to on the previous slide. You know, we can't expect children who come from these terrible home backgrounds um, to learn. And so that can translate into schools providing pastoral support and, and all kinds of other supports before they address academic attainment. Um, and my view would be that of course we need to look after the students um, you know needs for for food if they come to school without having a breakfast and so on and we do need to provide pastoral support but we also at the same time need to address um, academic supports as well um, the study that that finding came from was one in which the teachers also identified that one of the main barriers to students continuing with their education and finishing secondary school was actually their low literacy and numeracy skills. Um, but all the supports in the school were focusing on pastoral kinds of um, supports instead. So that didn't quite make sense logically. Um, again, 
neither of these students or their parents value education. The, the last one there is one that I've actually heard from researchers in, in the rural education space in particular, but sometimes in relation to low SES as well, where they talk about how when we talk about success in terms of attainment on standardised tests and university entrance and those kinds of things, that we're imposing a metrocentric or middle class um, view of success upon students for whom that might not be appropriate and that we should therefore define success differently for students from low SES and um, rural areas. Um, I think that's coming from a place of not wanting to look at these students from a deficit kind of viewpoint, which is very important and admirable. But it can also have the effect of tr almost trying to define the problem away. If we say that success is different for these students, we're, we're really entrenching um, lower academic expectations and, and that's not helpful. Um, that's my view anyway. <laughs> so, um, And then um, a lot of what I've been trying to grapple with for the last well, quite a few years actually, is um, how we can actually influence teachers' beliefs. And um, there's a lot of research that's been done over many decades that, that shows that beliefs are really quite hard to shift in the long term. And there are all kinds of debates about whether changing teachers' behaviour, changing their practice leads to change beliefs or whether you have to change the beliefs first and so on. Um, I think the consensus generally is that it's a bit of both. You work on both. Um, but there are particular beliefs that um, are implicated in the issues I've just been talking about that are what we call quite central, which means they're very connected to um, other beliefs that teachers have. Um, so they are the most hard to change. They're often connected to the teacher's own identity as a teacher. So um, you'll recall before I talked about how some of those beliefs that teachers have in laying the, the blame for problems outside of themselves are about protecting themselves and their own identity as an effective teacher. So they can protect that by saying, well, it's not my teaching, it's the family um, that these children come from. So those beliefs are, are most hard to change. They're often beliefs that are formed quite early in life from teachers' own experience of um, going to school or their early experiences of teaching. Um, and of course they've been formed early, lots of other beliefs do tend to be connected to them, so that makes them central. So because of all of that, belief change is really difficult work. Now I'm just mindful of the time, I could tell you some stories about some of the um, ways that I've formed my own beliefs about this, um, just to illustrate, but I might leave that for now and it might come up and might be relevant in our conversation because I think I've probably talked for long enough. So I'll finish with um, this photo which is actually the laneway into the farm where I spent a fair bit of my childhood. Um, so that's um, that's a nice little rural place where I grew up in Tasmania and my email's there as well so we can continue the conversation afterward if you'd like. Okay, I, I'll stop sharing and we can start talking or you can start talking and I can start listening. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, that was really a great presentation and we want to hear those stories. So I hope that you'll share some of those with us now. Um, when I saw your first slide about the tale of two countries, I thought about South Africa where we have this high GDP uh, coefficient. You know, the, there's a huge difference between those who have and those who don't. And uh -huh. sometimes it feels like it's, it's the tale of two worlds, not the tale of two countries. Yes. <laughs> really key to me, I mean, you speak about changing beliefs as one type of recommendation, but I'd like to know what other recommendations you have, because our problems, I guess, are very similar to what you found in your research. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, from your research, what sort of recommendations can you make? Um, I, I, I do think we fundamentally have to change the, the, the beliefs of, of school leaders um, as well as teachers. I think school leaders have an enormously important role to play in shaping the culture in their schools. Um, 
there obviously aren't easy answers to these things because if there were, we would have solved them. And I know these issues have been around for decades. Um, but I think, you know, I know education systems, certainly in Australia and, I, and other parts of the world as well, I'm not so sure about South Africa, but they've tried all kinds of things like giving teachers monetary incentives to go and teach in rural or difficult schools, um, low SES places, and they've, um, you know, tried subsidising their housing and, um, you know, offering scholarships for teachers to train and then go and teach in these places, none of which have been particularly effective. So I, I, I really think that um, an important thing that I'm sort of beginning to work on now is is how we can use um, stories to appeal and to connect with teachers' emotions and, and their identity, because I think that might be um, a key to perhaps shifting their beliefs in the directions um, that we want. Um, so I might just share one of my stories <laughs> just, just to illustrate that. Um, so when quite early in my teaching career, I think it was about my third year after I graduated, I was sent to a very rural town of only about 3,000 people in the far northwest of Tasmania, um, which has, that it's in an area which has the lowest rate of university um, education in Australia, um, other than the very remote areas of the Northern Territory. So it's pretty low levels of education. And I was told by the um, head of maths there that I was going to be taking the middle class of three in year nine. So he said this class has about half of them are in the top level and about half of them are in the middle level. And he was about to tell me, you know, show me the class list and tell me which kids were in which side of that divide. And something in me just instinctively said, no, no, no don't tell me, I'll, I'll figure it out. And I went into that classroom on the first maths lesson and I said to them, look, I've been told that half of you are level three, that was the most you know, high ability group, and half of you are in level two. I said, but I don't know which. I said, and I'm quite happy to go through the whole year not knowing, um, and I'm going to save myself a little bit of time and effort by teaching you all as if you're in level three. I'm just going to prepare one set of lessons and we'll, we'll do that for as long as it works. Um, so that's what I did. And the um, head of maths wrote all the tests for that group because he had the actual whole level three class as well. So I used his tests. And at the end of the year, um, all but two of them passed at level three. So there were at least a dozen kids in there who should not have even been offered that work, um, but they succeeded at it anyway. So that had a powerful impact on me as a teacher. I mean, we can read about the power of um, expectations and how it influences children, but actually experiencing that was was a powerful thing that shaped my beliefs and my real um, passion through the rest of my career to focus on um, trying to, to um, I guess, provide opportunities for children who don't get them otherwise and to and just my belief that all of these kids are capable of learning maths and most kids are capable of learning maths much better than um, we give them credit for and that we allow them to do. So I think the um, the other story that that student I mentioned who said I didn't realise I had to ask to learn maths, she's actually doing her PhD at the moment. Um, and some of the stories she's gathered in her data from low SES schools, I, I just find I I can't help but it almost brings me to tears when I read them. They're just so moving about the experiences of young um, teachers going into these schools, the honesty of their reflections about what they, they're thinking about these children who might be, you know, dirty or, you know, not well cared for apparently um, and the judgments they make and then how they shift as they um, grapple with those ideas and are challenged about them. So. So I really, I really do think that that getting stories that that um, tap into teachers' emotions is is a really key way of um, starting to shift their beliefs. So that was a very long answer to a question. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate that. It, it makes a lot of sense, and I think that it's something that 
um, maybe Sophie and, and the rest of the group can also look into and explore a bit more. So we've got a few questions or people are, would like to ask a few questions. So firstly, um, Tristan and then after that, Sumeya. But if anyone else would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or put your name in the comment or, or type your question in the comment. So Tristan, over to you, what would you like to say? Hello, um, very nice to meet you and be able to ask you a question. Just to confirm, we can both hear and see each other. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So I have been accused of my mic echoing a bit, so when you're answering, I, I'll switch it off. So if I forget, please yell at me. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to uh, sort of, if, you, if you'd allow me, to just sort of create a bit of a, a background to where I'd like to ask the question. It's a question I've been asked by my friends, and I've never found a satisfying answer. And I think, uh, as you would have found within what you have been doing in your research, is that we, we very, uh, are very much formed by the society we are part of. And I believe, as most of you are academics and teachers and so on, I think in terms of a moral obligation, one of the worst things is wasted potential. So, so my question is, how, you know, in terms of countries and so on, we're all very fixated about looking within our own borders and not with outside of our own borders. And okay. it most makes more sense to, to have a global society that's all interacting with one another and so you end up having a group that sits without that and not having that potential so what i wanted to ask is um what are your thoughts on sort of creating this globalist view and assisting more countries coming up to speed and, and sort of creating a global community which rather than a tribalistic one if, if, I, if I may mm, wow that's a big question i think it's possibly beyond my expertise <laughs> but, but um I mean, it's 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 definitely the way we should be thinking, and you know the the way. I, I don't know how we would ever get there. There is just such a tendency for politicians, at least, if not people generally, to be very nationalistic. Um, in Australia, even, and it's possibly the same in South Africa as well, where we have different states within Australia, they are even tribalistic. Um, and they, you know, whenever there are international test results come out, New South Wales likes to say, oh, we're better than South Australia and Western Australia and Queensland and, you know, Victoria must have cheated. Um, <laughs> so it even happens within countries. So it's probably something about human nature. But I think the more we can think on a global scale, um, you know, definitely, definitely and and not be tribal because i think we all win if everybody does better yeah i would very much agree with you i i personally very much enjoy looking at uh, the space agencies of the world because i think that is a perfect example of what we can achieve as a collective so yes. I, I suppose that's why i preemphasize it with saying that wasted potential is one of the worst things morally mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. it, it's I find it somewhat bothersome to consider that there may be a child living in a rural country that doesn't have uh, access to what we may have. And so you may miss out on finding the next Einstein, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think there, there are probably millions of such children around the world. Um, and I know one of, one of the dangers, you know, that the student I mentioned who was doing a PhD now came from a very low SSS school and whatever. There's a danger in sort of pointing to those students i mean she's marvelous and you want to say what a fabulous job she's done but there's a danger that people will point to those examples and say well look you can achieve it if you know you can do anything from that background if you work hard enough and if you're smart enough um and we forget the fact that the people who do manage to achieve often they've got terribly lucky or they're very exceptional um in in various ways and there'd be a whole um, bunch of students that she went through school with who could have achieved wonderful things um, if they'd been as as lucky as her or had just been in a different suburb <laughs> so it's you know it, it's there just must be millions of people wasted potential around the world and it really is tragic it, it actually makes me quite angry when I think about those things <laughs> well, well thank you very much for answering my question I suppose <laughs> Perhaps it is quite, in fact, a, a difficult thing to, to answer. 
Um, but mm -hmm. I we do have other people who would like to ask questions. So thank you very much, and I'll leave the floor open. Justin, thank you for your question. I mean, it it again reminds us of the importance of collaboration and the role that it plays in development. Um, I hope that you finally sat, got a satisfactory answer to your question. <laughs> so, um, up next, we've got a question from Sumeya. Sumeya, are you there? Hi. Yes. Um, can everyone hear me? My internet is giving me problems. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I joined a little late, but this is about um, developing mathematical abilities at a young age. So um, I'm privileged enough to come from a background where growing up, my mom introduced me to educational games. And like before I went to school, I knew about counting and addition and subtraction, and it made it easier for me to grasp these concepts. And a lot of children, especially like, okay, I'm not sure about the world, but like in South Africa and the backgrounds they come from and what they do at daycare or preschool and stuff like that, it may not um, develop like the math background. And um, I just want to know in terms of that, what do you think we can do to combat that and like help? children from a young age to engage with mathematics? Hmm. That, that's a good question. Um, part, part of the um, inequality situation in Australia, and it's probably the same elsewhere as well, is that there's actually lower attendance of children in, at preschool and, um, and daycare in rural areas compared to urban areas. And the Australian government has done a lot of work in recent decades really on raising the quality of care in daycare like the qualifications of the educators that work in child care um, and trying to raise the quality of that and now um, education departments and governments are trying to increase the rates at which children in low SES and rural areas particularly attend those settings um, in the hope that they will get some of those experiences that their parents might be less equipped um, than more middle-class parents perhaps to, to provide, um, not which is a huge generalisation because um, a lot of uh, poorer parents do a fantastic job providing these experiences as well. But, um, you know, it does rely on a certain level of education among the parents and, and resources, time and emotional energy and all kinds of things to, to be able to do that. So trying to trying to um, make really high quality childcare and preschool education available um, really broadly in society is is certainly one way that Australia is trying to tackle that sort of issue. Um, and and I think um, other other things that I've seen some schools do is is trying to um, well, having programs to try to engage families and parents in their mathematics program. So there might be a school aged child, but other children at home as well. And if we can get parents engaged in um, mathematics with their through their school aged child, we can give them things they can do at home with other children too. So that might be another part of that solution, but it's it's not easy as well. So Yes, um, I also just wanted to comment that like <laughs> mom once spoke about, because she teaches mathematics at, uh, mm -hmm. at underprivileged school and she mm -hmm. has always spoken about like starting like almost like a community engagement where mm -hmm. like we go to these preschools because sometimes you have daycares because parents are working like the whole day so they send their kids to like someone and this person doesn't really have qualifications they just know how to work with children so they mm -hmm. just look after the kids for the day and just like engage with them and be like this is the educational things you can do with children, you know, just yeah. to help them. Um, yeah. and I think South Africa could benefit from that because we are still a developing country, you know, and we don't have, I don't know, our government <laughs> in terms of like giving education and stuff like that is a bit tri trippy, but yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, that, sound, that sounds good. Yeah. 
Thank you for your question, Sumaya. So we've got questions from Steve Sherman and Leslie Scott. And just a reminder, if anyone else has any question, please raise your hand or put your name in the chat. Um, Steve Sherman, are you there? I am indeed. Hello, Kim. How are you? I'm Steve. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing the insights uh, from your research. Um, we we are uh, well. I, I'm involved with an educational NGO, and we go into schools and we we make maths fun for kids. Uh, we also do um, extension, but we also do remediation in in underserved areas. And obviously, the 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 most prominent things that stand out are that students who come from uh, rural areas or underprivileged areas they don't have access to the same resources. They certainly don't have access to the same teachers that uh, schools in the inner cities would have uh, because, it, I mean, if you think about the logic of it, if a government was funding uh, the salaries of teachers and you were a teacher, a, a really good teacher looking for a job, you're not going to rush to one of the poorest areas where there might be violence, where there might be a difficulty to travel on your own. You would obviously want to apply at the better um, government schools within the city and, and subsequently, um, you, you don't always have access to the best teachers in some of these uh, schools in the townships, uh, as, as we described them. Um, but what has been fascinating is that COVID-19 hit, and all of a sudden, the kids who had the least exposure to teaching now had none for several months. So that has set back uh, learning in, in ways that we'll probably only ever discover in the next couple of years through research. But what has come out is that some students were given access to great teachers over the internet, whether it be through a community organization or a business that provided uh, internet access or, or, or laptops or tablets. Um, what is your take on Schools 2.0, where mm -hmm. we start to make use of the internet and technological tools where you can take one teacher and put them into 10 schools at the same cost. So now, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, if, 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 if it's a case of we don't have any qualified teachers in an area, now you can have a team of three for an area that is, let's say, 40 or 50 times the size. And, and, and teachers can tap into that expertise and those skills at any time. The real issue is, do we have internet that can reach there? And do they have the equipment to, to manage that? So I, I just wanted to hear your take on that. Hmm. I, I think that's definitely part of the answer. I, I know in Australia, um, even just, you know, with six hours from Sydney, the teachers were telling me the internet's not terribly reliable. <laughs> but but it's certainly something that, that um, is, is part of the Australian government's strategy um, to deal with, or the, the New South Wales government, it's a, it's a state responsibility for education. But they're, they're, they are thinking about exactly that sort of model, like using a teacher to teach students remotely, um, you know, from wherever that teacher happens to be. And as you say, they can reach a number of schools and small groups of kids in different locations simultaneously and so on. Um, the, the only thing that um, I, I think is sometimes missing from those models is that, that could be relatively easily done, although it would cost a little more, is to also ensure that the less qualified teacher at the school with the actual children is present in those lessons as well so that we're simultaneously using that teaching as a way to build the capacity of the local teacher as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess in, in one sense you're paying the, the, you know, an extra teacher at the same time so it's slightly more expensive. But I think longer term, if we can use that to build the capacity of teachers as well as to provide that good teaching to the students, then that's even better. And it also um, means that after the lesson, there's an adult in the room um, who's been exposed to the same material who can hopefully um, help the children work through that and process it. So, yeah, I think it's definitely part of the solution. Awesome, awesome, thank you. No. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, for your question. Um, Leslie Scott, you have a question. Hi, yes, thanks. First of all, Kim, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, my question for you is, it's a two part question. And the first one is obviously in maybe rural and areas where there is a higher rate of illiteracy and um, non numeracy, people may not see the value of mathematics, especially as, um, you know, as the years go by. So obviously basic arithmetic, you know, is something that's seen as useful, but as children get older, and concepts get more abstract, um, all the members in the community who have maybe never needed to use mathematics do perhaps see it as being something peripheral to the needs of the community. So my first question is, how do you believe we can make mathematics more relatable, not just to students, but to communities as a whole? And then from there on, um, how, how do you feel about, I know in South Africa, it is one way that in the medical field, um, they are trying to ensure that there are quality medical professionals everywhere, is encouraging people who come from rural and lower economic areas to study in that field with the hopes that they will return to where they live in order to, to take up you know, that profession. So where you are, is, is, a, is something like that in place? Um, I'll try and remember the two bits of that question. So in fact, um, I've already forgotten the first one, but I'll start <laughs> with the second one. You can remind me of the first one. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so de that, that idea of, um, I've heard it called grow your own, sort of in terms of teachers, like if you encourage people from a local community to maybe go away and study to become a teacher, then they are more likely to come back to their local community. And there is some truth in that. Um, what, what I have found in my research though, that even when that happens, some of those teachers are not necessarily going to have different um, beliefs from some of those um, unhelpful ones that I talked about in the presentation. And I, my hypothesis is that the reason for that could be that um, when, when you have um, an area where there are very low rates of university um, study and, and qualification, um, if someone goes away to university to become a teacher, they are often quite an exceptional person from their local town. Not many people do that. Um, and they have probably spent a good deal of their school life being told that they are clever and exceptional and whatever in various ways. And off they go to university and then they come back. And they come back with a belief about themselves that they've formed through their childhood, that they are a bit exceptional um, and not quite like the other most of the people in that community. And they still have that belief. And you know, I've met teachers in, you know, who fit that sort of model who actually believe, um, because of their own experience, that university education is for the exceptional children in this town only and not for so many of them. Um, and so they don't necessarily have higher expectations. So it doesn't necessarily, you actually can get teachers there, but you don't necessarily get teachers with high expectations of those children, which is, um, I guess having a teacher there at all is, is a step forward, but it's not the full answer. Um, and the first part of your question, yeah, the was first part of my question was relating to making maths relatable uh, yes, yes. Um, across the generations, obviously to encourage yes. further mathematics study. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I mean, in all the times I've talked to parents in rural communities, um, I, I am yet to meet, or, or in any community actually, I am yet to meet a parent who doesn't want the absolute best for their child. Um, so I think that's that's a given. Um, and so I think the key to 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 get parents on board is simply to simply perhaps not simply, but to help them to understand that all the doors that mathematics can open for their child, um, all the opportunities that it affords, how important it is for employment. And in my experience, the majority of parents kind of understand that. Um, they often are quite negative about maths themselves from their own experience of studying at school, but they do know it's important. And I know, um, you know a lot of the TIMS data from certainly Australia's TIMS data shows that students will say they'll agree quite strongly that maths is important, 
but it's almost like it's important for somebody else. It's important, but I don't want to study it. <laughs> so, so I don't think it's too hard to convince people that maths is important. Um, in terms of the relevance thing, I think um, there's there's some work to do with helping teachers to understand the relevance of mathematics to the jobs in the local community. For example, just um, a fortnight ago when I was out in the country um, town, I interviewed a teacher out there um, and I was talking to her about the industries in the local area and she knew that the main industries were mining and agriculture. And I asked her what she thought the students needed to know to get jobs in those industries. And she um, talked mainly about agriculture and she was talking about things, oh, they need to know about soil and about how to look after animals and how to grow crops and whatever. But there was no awareness evident in her responses that of just how technological farming has become. Um, just, you know, there are a whole lot of computer systems on, you know, weather monitoring and soil monitoring and, you know, really sophisticated drone technology even. And it's, you know, it's, it's a highly um, mathematical and scientific endeavour now in, in, a, in a lot of modern farming. And so I think helping teachers to understand some of those things better would be useful. The, the other comment I'd make about that, and this is, this is really from my own experience of teaching um, math to children in rural areas. Um, I, I had lots of years of kids saying, you know, what we hear they say all the time, oh, when will I ever use this? Why do I have to do this algebra or whatever? Um, and I think if we're math teachers, we might all have heard that. <laughs> And I tried for years to kind of answer that and say, oh, but you know, you need it for this, it's really important in this or that job or whatever. And um, was never terribly happy with the answers. And it occurred to me that um, I don't think my colleagues who were teaching art or English got asked that question nearly as often, even though most children will never have to um, analyze the plot of a novel or paint a portrait in their job. <laughs> but they still don't ask those questions. And so I started answering that question when students asked me in maths classes with um, not answering it really. I would just say, where did I lose you? Because I, I figured out eventually that in most cases that question is really a cry for help about how meaningless this maths is. I just don't understand it and I'm feeling lost. And it's socially acceptable in a maths class in front of all your peers to say that this is useless and irrelevant and I'm not going to use it because everybody says that, rather than to say I'm lost, I don't understand with the implication I might be dumb. So I think for a lot of students it's really, really a, a protest about things being meaningless. Um, and I think it was important that I said where did I lose you rather than where did you get lost because that was um, subtly, but importantly, I think, putting the problem back in my court rather than it's your problem. It was, you know, I have lost you. So there's something wrong with my teaching potentially. So um, yeah, I could, there's a, there's a lot to that um, issue, I think, but that's just a few thoughts. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Leslie, thank you for that question. I see that there are a few comments in the chat. Kim, are you able to see those? Um, I'm just click. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> okay, so this is Ron from Sadiqa Dawood, and she says this is a great solution, Kim. We have an excess of teachers in South Africa. I like the idea of PD. Um, I think she means professional development. Is that right, Sadiqa? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was really interesting, that question also, because I was wondering about the teachers. A lot of the times there's, there's, this, concept, there's this misconception and bigger conception of teachers in South Africa who aren't good enough, who don't know what they are doing, who aren't knowledgeable. And I'm sure that that takes a toll emotionally on teachers. Um, you know, I wonder if we had teachers who are excited and who feel confident about what they're doing, that that surely impacts their teaching of mathematics too. So capacity development really is, is, is essential, you know, mm -hmm. building confidence in teachers um, so that they feel capable enough to, to take on the, the job that's in front of them. So, so thank you for that. Um, there's, another, there's another question coming from Tristan, who says on a side note, I believe that SpaceX is currently working towards a global internet provided through CubeSat Starlink. 
In addition, what is everyone's take on utilizing the Flying Eye Hospital or this approach to providing education solutions to very rural communities? Um, Kim, do you want him to expand on that or do you want to respond to that? Um, I, I, I'm, I might just um, give a, have a guess at what um, the Flying Eye Hospital or this approach might be and then Tristan can correct me if I'm completely wrong. Um, so is, is that where some eye specialists fly into remote communities to work their magic? Is that, that what we mean, Tristan? Is that the, the model? So, so essentially, the the Flying Eye Hospital, if if I remember correctly, it's a it's an aircraft that was donate di, uh, sorry, geez, I can't talk today. Donated, um, donated for humanitarian type of missions, and it was outfitted as a hospital, and it flies with us volunteer specialists to remote countries to um, give people the gift of sight, essentially. So I was. Thinking would, what would your take be on having, say, for instance, a big company put out a bit of money uh, to also maybe out, outfit the aircraft and then fly it into uh, rural areas and offer it as a sort of uh, makeshift school? Mm. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an idea I hadn't, I hadn't thought about in quite that way. But um, in terms of professional development for teachers, I think the idea of taking the professional development to the teachers is definitely a good idea. Um, I know rural teachers that I've talked to all over the place, when they talk about, um, certainly in New South Wales, all the professional development opportunities are in Sydney. And if they want to come to Sydney, it's a day of travel at least to get there and a day of travel to go back. And so the school's got to find a replacement um, person for three days just for one day of PD <laughs> and um, so that's that just makes it hugely difficult um, so I get again technology is part of it but but I, I said to someone in the education department just recently in fact if we use technology to deliver professional development to rural areas why couldn't we have the presenter actually in the rural school delivering it online to people in Sydney <laughs> just just for a change <laughs> that would be kind of fair so um and i have been part of a project um a few years ago now where where we actually got a team of us together some university people and some education department people um and we we actually liaised with a group of schools in a rural area about what their professional development needs were in maths and we prepared a whole program for a fortnight um and we all travelled there and lived there for a fortnight and gave them all kinds of PD from one-on-one -on -one demonstration lessons to after-school workshops to group planning meetings with grade groups across the schools and all kinds of things for an entire fortnight, which almost killed us. But it was great for the schools. <laughs> it meant that we were sort of there with them in their context and, and they didn't have to do all that travel and they got great PD. So that's probably the closest I've seen to that sort of model. But I think definitely ways of getting PD to those teachers instead of expecting them to do all the travel or all the sitting at the end of the camera instead of in the live venue um, makes a lot of sense. I don't know if that's helped or not, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big, big ideas or big ways of thinking. Um, mm. I think what's really important is thinking about sustainability. So we need to find solutions that that are low cost and that are sustainable for them to really work. Um, so, so let's put on our thinking caps and, and, and consider that a bit more. Sumi, mm. I know your hand has been up for quite some time, so now's your chance to ask your question. Thank you. Um, mine actually goes back to when Kim was speaking about parents wanting what's best for their kids. And I think in South Africa, we have a really big problem, especially in terms of, of our poverty and mm -hmm. the amount of people that are in poor areas and rural areas and the level of education of those people. Because mm -hmm. from apartheid, what happened was that we were left with a large part of our population that hasn't received a good education. Be mm -hmm. And so... Those people who are living in rural areas that don't know 
that what what is good for my child educationally so we had a domestic who was working by us um during covid and her son wasn't able to go to school for months like we said earlier because mm-hmm. there's just no teacher or they can't have it happen and she never like it was fine for her son to be there but like she never necessarily understood why i would want to teach her son math you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because that's something that's important you can use mathematics to do this and it's also because the people that they are surrounded by that this boy will grow up around they don't use mm-hmm. mathematics in their everyday life and so i feel like it's also mentally the space that they grow up in in terms of how mm-hmm. mathematics is viewed and it's mm-hmm. important in their life um mm-hmm. but yes yeah, i want- I my the second part of my question was the or my question was how to combat that and like the host said we need like um things that don't cost a lot of money mm. because yes because of the situation but yeah 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 no it it's a, it is a really it's a really really tricky um question and I don't think it's going to be solved I don't, I don't even think lots of money would necessarily solve it. I think it's it it is something that's going to take a lot of time to solve. So it's almost a generational thing like one of those teachers said it really is actually that. Um even if even when we have teachers with all the right expectations and and doing the absolute best they can. It's it's going to take um I guess some of some of those parents and communities seeing examples of of children going away um and perhaps you know achieving well and and doing great things and they can actually see how what a difference education um made in their lives but it's yeah with in some of those um you know in really really poor areas and and I imagine some of the really remote parts of Australia are probably um similar where there are you know indigenous communities who have been um you know there's just huge rates of poverty and um disadvantage in those places and you know where english is you know a second language and parents that haven't necessarily had um successful interactions with education as well so it, it they they are massive problems um but i think i think we just have to keep persevering and we definitely need to do whatever we can to get the very best teachers in front of those children um and and working with those parents as well but yeah there's no easy answer thank you prof i wonder if we could squeeze one more question in if you don't mind i think i'm fine <laughs> okay sure now's your chance okay hello um I uh, thanks for your time and we we our time is almost limited but uh coming to an end but one thing that gets to me which is fascinating is how we develop our expectations of students and kids in our mm-hmm. classrooms and what how do we um label them and identify them mm-hmm. um and your story of of going into that classroom at um not knowing where they were graded or what level they were at um that hit a note with me and we've had debates and discussions about whether we should put students in classes uh, of uh, according to their strength and their outcomes and their abilities um or whether we should just mix them up and randomly yeah. put them into classes in that way uh and yeah. it's, it gets to be quite a heated debate because it, there's there's arguments on both sides uh mm. for and against putting them in those streams and I'd just be fascinated to hear your perspective from your experience um yeah. what do you think how how that works Yeah, I mean, I mean other people have done done quite a bit of research that shows that um grouping children by attainment, they often say ability, but it's really just by what they've attained so far, um is is detrimental to most children. Um it it's not necessarily detrimental to the high achievers, but they don't suffer if they're in a mixed group either if if there's a good teacher there. So, it's a little more challenging for the teacher who's got to cater for that bigger diversity of students but it's much better for the students to be um in a in a mixed group the um the, the students who are a little bit um lower attaining at the moment can actually see where where they could go you know what's possible 
Um, and so, so I, I definitely would be in favour of the mixed ability groups. Um, and there, I, I, you know, there, there are terms I, that you may be familiar with that other researchers have used, like having tasks that have low floors and high ceilings. So they're easy for every child to access the task, um, you know, problem solving, open ended sorts of tasks. But they're also um, scope within the problem for students to do very sophisticated maths as well. So students can, you know, can they can all do it, um, and they, there's room for them to surprise you as well. Um, one of the things I used to do when I was teaching maths was to um, give the students a fair bit of autonomy about what they did. So, you know, one of the last schools I taught at, um, the the school had spent money buying textbooks, so I sort of was obliged to use them. But I would say to the students, well, you know, the next couple of weeks we're going to be working on chapter whatever. I said, you know, it's about this topic, I said, you know, let's let's just have a little outline. Here are the main ideas. Now you decide where you want to start, how many of each exercise you want to do, um, and as long as you can justify that to me, that's fine. I don't care how much you do. <laughs> and some of the students would would decide, I'm just going to do the last question in each exercise, and I'd say to them, Well, why is that? And then they'd have to justify, they'd say, oh, that's where well, the hardest one is, so I can do that and I can do all the others. And then I'd say to them, well, how do you know it's harder? Which would make them look at another one. <laughs> and they'd, um, and so they do a lot much, much more sophisticated thinking about the mathematics um, because they had to do the kind of mathematics that the textbook writer actually did, thinking about the structure of problems and the sequence of understanding and so on. Um, but they also had autonomy. And so they were much more engaged. They were making decisions for themselves and the you know the less confident kids would do lots of questions the more confident ones would do fewer um and and they all just felt better and more motivated about it so th those sorts of approaches are really useful but i think having the mixture of kids is good and just one other thing about um seeing where what, what's possible one of the problems with teachers um, being in low ses schools in rural areas is that they only see students who come from disadvantaged families relatively and so if that's where they've spent their entire career and often if they're beginning teachers that's obviously necessarily the case they get sent to these remote schools and that's what they've seen and so they never get to see what a really well resourced well supported 14 year old can do <laughs> and so that sets a ceiling on their expectations so yeah, which is another another problem with the low SES and rural schools. Yeah, so sorry, I answered a bit. Thank there. you. No, that makes that makes good sense. Thank you for your for your insight on that. So um, I think that really brings our discussion to an end today. So thank you so much, Professor Bestwick, um, for your presentation and for so generous, generously sharing your expertise with us. I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us today, who asked any questions, who shared their comments in the chat. I know that there are some comments that I haven't had a time to had a chance to read out, um, but we have seen them. Thank you so much for them. And I'd also like to thank the team who've put this together. A special thank you to Sean and to Sophie um, for arranging all these talks. So thank you everyone for joining us. Again, Professor, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next discussion. Bye everyone. Yeah, no, thank you all for your questions and the opportunity. And I love the comment about the movie industry. That's <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.